Coming up today, President Park and Hay looks set to veto a controversial bill that enables lawmakers to request changes to government enacted ordinances. Two major hospitals in Seoul have partially closed in a bid to finally stem the outbreak of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in Korea. Plus, Korea marks the 65th anniversary of the start of the Korean War. With the scars lasting to this day, we have a special report about the history of the conflict. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6am on Thursday, June 25th here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We start with the controversial parliamentary bill that is awaiting President Park and Hay's final approval. There's mounting speculation the president will refuse the passage of the revised National Assembly Act that enables lawmakers to request changes to government enacted ordinances. According to officials at the presidential office of Chong Wade, President Park appears to have made up her mind to exercise her right to veto the revised bill, citing its unconstitutionality and the potential to wreak havoc in government. She is expected to veto the bill as soon as today when she chairs a cabinet meeting later this morning. The meeting was postponed for two days to accommodate ministers who took part in an interpolation session at the National Assembly until Wednesday. Now to the latest developments regarding the outbreak of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in Korea. And health authorities say the situation is now at a crossroads. While the spread of the MERS virus seems to have levelled off somewhat, they stress it's too early to declare the worst is over. Two major hospitals in Seoul suspended services to patients on Wednesday after four new cases were reported. Gongguk University Medical Center stopped admitting new patients after it found that two of the patients reported were not under quarantine orders or home isolation, raising concerns there may be more cases still under the radar. Samsung Medical Center, considered the epicenter of the virus, also decided to extend its partial shutdown after another patient there was confirmed with MERS. The latest cases raise the total number of people diagnosed with the virus to 179, with the death toll remaining at 27. Meanwhile, the number of schools suspending classes nationwide is on the rise again, from 6 to 14. They're mostly schools located close to hospitals that were visited by MERS patients. President Park and Hay held talks with international experts on Wednesday about improving Korea's handling of new infectious diseases like the MERS virus. As information on such illnesses can be rather limited, specialists from the World Health Organization and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention stress that even a medically advanced country like Korea should always be prepared. Choi Yusun reports. Admitting that Korea lacked preparation to prevent the entry and spread of the MERS virus, President Park Geun-hye sought the visiting international experts' advice on ways to enhance the country's response to foreign diseases. One of the specialists from the World Health Organization advised Korean healthcare facilities to have an expert on hand at all times to prevent the spread of infectious diseases and to properly educate and train medical personnel. The specialists added health authorities need to cooperate with officials and experts from other areas, including education, in their response, and that it's important to create scenarios about the disease and conduct simulations. President Bak pointed out tendencies among Koreans to seek medical help at tertiary referral hospitals and to visit families and friends when they are hospitalized as major factors that contributed to the MERS outbreak. She added there's a need for response measures that consider cultural customs unique to Korea. An expert from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention stressed how distribution of distorted information through social networking services could make responding to an outbreak more difficult. 
Such was the case in Korea, and the expert added it's important to communicate not only within the country, but with the international community. In a globalized society where people freely travel across borders, President Bak and the experts agreed there will be more new diseases and the country should continuously share related information. For Korea's part, President Bak vowed to be transparent in informing the international community about new infectious diseases in the country and its response. Che Yusan, Arirang News. Now, today, Thursday, June 25th, 2015, marks 65 years since the start of the Korean War. The conflict started when forces from the Communist North launched a surprise attack on the South. To mark the anniversary, our Park ji has a brief summary of a conflict that cost so many lives and leaves the nation divided to this day. The Korean War began with some 75,000 North Korean forces crossing the 38th parallel, the border that divided Soviet-backed North Korea and pro-Western South Korea. On the early morning of June 25, in 1950, 65 years ago, North Korean tanks reached the outskirts of the South Korean capital Seoul the next day. Within a few days, the city was taken by communist forces. In the following three months, they conquered nearly all of the Korean peninsula, except for some deep southern regions like Daegu and Busan. Eventually, the tide turned with the help of U.S. and U.N. forces. Western powers saw North Korea's attack as part of the rising threat of communism. The U.N. sent in allied forces composed of troops from 15 countries to stop the communist advance. On September 15, General Douglas MacArthur, Commander-in-Chief of United Nations Command, successfully carried out the Incheon landing operation, restoring the South Korean capital Seoul in late September. And by the end of October, the Allied forces were nearly able to push back the battle lines to the northernmost provinces of the peninsula. It seemed like the war would soon end. But with a sudden massive intervention of communist Chinese soldiers backing North Korea in late 1950, Seoul was retaken by communist forces in January the following year. After that, the war became a bloody stalemate. Allied forces fought back and retook Seoul in mid-March of 1951, but the warring continued and the casualties grew. And that's when the U.S. began examining a ceasefire. American officials first proposed the idea to Russia in May 1951. After some two more years of negotiations and ongoing hostilities, an armistice treaty was finally signed in July 1953, bringing the bitter fighting to an end. The three-year war, which was the first major military action of the Cold War between the Western powers and communist countries, caused the lives of some five million people, both armed forces and civilians, and left the Korean Peninsula divided almost the same as before the war. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, since the Korean War, the two Koreas have more than gone their separate ways socially and politically in terms of economic clout, though there is no contest at all. The South has risen uh, from the ashes of that conflict to become the world's 11th largest economy, while North Korea still struggles in poverty. Kim Min-ji reports. 65 years on, the two Koreas stand on very different levels on the economic ladder. South Korea's economy is 43 times bigger than North Korea's and boasts a trade volume that is nearly 154 larger. Although Pyongyang has been stepping up efforts to reform and opening up its economy, experts say there have been limitations due to a socialist structure and inability to build enough trust to lure overseas capital. North Korea is trying to pursue marketization, but it's not being achieved to its fullest since it will pose a threat to the leader's hold on power. Also, the North is a country that comes with risks. It doesn't abide by international regulations. The North's relations with its main ally and trade partner China hasn't been on good footing either. They've been on different pages after Pyongyang carried out its third nuclear test in 2013. Recently, the regime has been cozying up to Russia, agreeing on several infrastructure projects and holding more frequent high-level exchanges. 
But trade between the two has only amounted to about $100 million, relatively small in size compared to the $6.5 billion it's reached with China. Experts say if Pyongyang is ever to foster an environment where it can steer its own economy, it will need Seoul to stand forefront and lift sanctions it imposed on the North after the torpedoing of a South Korean warship back in 2010. The South needs to lift sanctions in order to expand trade with North Korea and provide a foundation for Pyongyang to lead its own economic growth. This will also help the North achieve the economic reforms it's trying to pursue. As we saw in Germany's case, huge costs accompany unification. This is the only way we can reduce the financial burden. The experts said improving inter-Korean relations and achieving economic cooperation for now is the best way for Pyongyang to make use of its labor and resources and actively draw in capital to prop up its ailing economy. Kim min Arirang News. The United Nations human rights chief currently in Seoul on a three-day visit met with three surviving Korean victims of Japan's wartime sex slavery on Wednesday. He promised continued UN support for the women in resolving the highly emotive issue. Hang sang reports. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Zaid Rad Al Hussein visited the victims of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement, calling them the most important people to meet in Seoul. I cannot think of three more important meet, uh, people uh, to meet in Seoul than these three very courageous, uh, frail and, uh, and quite old, but uh, still uh, very passionate about what they went through, uh, their suffering and their caring uh, for others who suffer still in so many uh, parts of the world. With the recent passing of two of the so-called comfort women, only 50 surviving victims registered with the government remain in Korea. For decades, they have been waiting for Japan's sincere apology and compensation, but time is not on their side. The UN human rights chief said the voices of these women are the strongest and the most important in resolving the issue. He promised continued support from the United Nations, saying that the UN is consulting with the governments of Korea and Japan. My predecessor, Navi Pile, uh, spoke loudly about the continued suffering, and I have done the same, and I will endeavor to uh, continue to advocate on their behalf. The meeting is expected to send an indirect message to the Japanese government to swiftly resolve this long-standing sensitive issue. Hwang sang Arirang News. A former Japanese prime minister has slammed the incumbent administration amid the growing prospect that current prime minister Shinzo Abe will not seek cabinet endorsement for his upcoming speech marking the 70th anniversary of Japan's defeat in World War II. Tokyo-based Kyoto News Agency reports that while giving us a lecture in Osaka on Wednesday, Tomiichi Murayama said Abe's statement should be issued after the cabinet officially approves it, otherwise it will be meaningless. Muriyama noted that a similar war statement issued on the 60th anniversary in August 2005, which acknowledged Japanese aggression and expressed deep remorse, including a heartfelt apology, was approved by the cabinet at that time. Now, food is one of the main things a tourist weighs up when deciding where to visit. And realising that people want to enjoy memorable eating experiences when they visit a country, experts and officials have been putting their heads together at the Milan World Expo to discuss how Korean food, or hanshik, can be used to draw more international travellers to Korea. Our Na Hyung Young files this report from Milan. Officials from Korea and the OECD held a one-day conference at this year's Milan World Expo to talk about how Korea can better utilize the concept of hanshik to boost tourism. This comes as hanshik is winning global recognition as a healthy and sustainable alternative to heavy high-calorie diets found in other parts of the world. 
I hope there will be active discussions on how each country's unique specialty food can successfully be integrated with competitive contacts to promote the development of the tourism industry. Korean cuisine has evolved over the course of the country's roughly 5,000-year history, adopting the science of storage and fermentation of food. It's this very aspect that leads experts to believe Hanshik has a lot to offer the global community in terms of food security and nutrition, and also why this aspect should be highlighted more to give a strong context to Hanshik. And I want to understand what the Koreans uh, want to say about this uh, uh, Hanshik, and I think people will come from all over to understand and to discover that and to take it home. In that sense, the Korea Pavilion at the Expo serves as a great venue to spread the word far and wide as visitors can see firsthand the concept of Korea's traditional method of storage and fermentation. After learning more about the food, they also have the option of tasting hanshik. With experts emphasizing the importance of a story and strong brand power, the government is working hard to promote the health benefits and uniqueness of Korean food and the knowledge that this will eventually bring in more visitors to the country. Na Hyun Gyeong, Arirang News, Milan. Well, that's pretty much all we have for now, but we do have some good news for our viewers in Seoul as the city's bus drivers have called off their planned strike that was due to start this morning. So hopefully your commute will be uh, relatively hassle-free. Stay tuned for Business Daily. That's coming up at 8 a.m. Korea time right here on Arirang TV. Thank you as always for watching. Goodbye.